two young boys stumble upon mysterious stone heads while digging in the garden. It unleashes a chilling wave of paranormal activity. But the horror doesn't stop at their doorstep, because the house next door soon becomes haunted by terrifying apparitions. Even more shocking, when an archaeology professor takes the heads 300 miles away to study at her home, her family is plunged into a supernatural nightmare of their own. Join me as we delve into the spine-chilling 1970s case that captivated the media, including the BBC. I'm Peter Laws, and this is the horror of the Hexham Heads. Hexham is a small market town in the northeast of England. It's rich in history and culture, and it sits just over 20 miles west of the city of Newcastle. And it's home to the first ever purpose-built jail in England, the name Hexham possibly comes from a fairly innocent old English phrase, but there are references to darker themes. There are records of the town's name being used as a curse, possibly because of the jail. But there was a time when people on the borders would even use the word Hexham as a euphemism for hell. Well, after tonight's case, you might find the idea of hell and curses quite fitting. You see, a short walk from the town centre you will find an estate of small red-bricked houses. And if you were to wander through this estate, it might not be easy to tell the houses apart. They all follow a fairly similar design. And yet, there is one house that stands out from the others because it would be the source of a string of terrifying supernatural incidents that would cross the country in a case that still perplexes researchers to this day. The house in question is on Reed Avenue, and the story begins in 1971 when the Robson family moved into number three. The house is semi-detached, and so number one Reed Avenue is next door. The two properties are separated by only a brick wall. That wall will soon feel awfully thin in the days ahead. The move went well, and the Robsons were settling into their new home, but then the 11-year-old son, Colin, was in the garden, clearing weeds and he was in the corner by the hedge. He was raking up soil, probably saw worms and spiders and beetles scuttling around. But what he didn't expect to see, however, were the heads. As Colin was digging, he noticed a strange round object lodged into the soil. He scraped more of it away and managed to prise it out from the dirt, and he looked at it. He was confused. It may have looked like a stone at first, but this thing was very heavy and well-rounded. He pulled it out and held it up. It was the size of something between a tennis ball or a tangerine, small enough to be held in one hand anyway. And yet even more curious, this stone had a face. Confused but delighted with his strange find, Colin hollered back towards the house for his younger brother to come. Leslie Robinson had been sat in the upstairs window watching Colin digging. So he came rushing down the stairs to see what all the fuss was about. Colin held up the head, and after a quick look, they both agreed to start digging in the rest of the garden to look for more. And there was more. Leslie Robinson's finger plunged through the cold soil, and he too touched a rounded curve of stone. He dug around it and rolled it out, and it was indeed a second stone ball around the same size as the first, though a little bigger. And the two boys just stared at these things with their beady little holes for eyes, the slight protrusion of a nose, the slits of a mouth. Both heads looked a little menacing, to be honest, one due to its pinched face and straight line of a mouth as if it was angry. This one would later be labelled by researchers as the male. But the other one, the slightly larger one, had a disconcerting grin that became known as the female. Some would even later call this head the old woman, the witch or the hag and would argue that this was the stone that would become the source of the horrific activity to come. They could see that the stone was grey with a hint of green, possibly sandstone. But the heads also seemed to sparkle under the light, which suggested that maybe there was some sort of quartz in there. And they also had a little bump at the bottom where the neck was, which suggested that they had previously been joined to something else, a body, one assumes, so that they might have been little statues or idols. While well, the boys were very pleased with their find and showed them off to neighbours, then they set the heads down as an ornament and went to bed. And now they were out of the soil. The horror began. The boys would place the heads down, then go to sleep. 
Yet when they woke up, their heads would have moved. I don't mean they rolled off the table, landed on the floor, that they were no longer on the side, but they were, you know, up on a shelf somewhere in the house. I just mean that they had turned ever so slightly, as if these long dead eyes wanted to get a better view of something or someone. The spontaneous moving of the heads began to happen more and more. But then, a whole string of disturbing activity began, and the Robson family noticed that it tended to happen around 2.30 a.m. in the morning. For example, the family began to find household objects that had been broken or smashed for no reason. They had a mirror, for example, which was found to be shattered. The surrounding pieces of that mirror were discovered elsewhere in the house, where they were sitting in the frying pan. Was this some sort of threat to place sharp and dangerous shards where the family might want to eat? Well, one time the family were watching television when suddenly they heard a sound that shocked them nearly out of their skins. It was the sound of a sudden whiplash that cracked out from behind the television. An electrical surge or snap, maybe. But then the activity just kept getting worse. For example, the Robson family consisted of two sons, but also had some daughters. And one of those girls had a frightening experience with a mattress in the bedroom. It was suddenly and inexplicably showered with shards of glass. Yet this growing supernatural force was not content to stay in the Robson house. Remember, the Robsons had moved into a semi-detached house, meaning it was connected to another house separated by merely a brick wall. The Robsons lived at number three, but next door, in number one, was Mrs. Nellie Dodd and her family. And she was about to have an experience that she openly shared with the Tyneside newspaper in 1972, and this was the stuff of pure nightmare. Mrs. Dodd had children, a son and three daughters. And after the heads had been discovered next door, the Dodd children started to complain of being touched by something in their room at night. They said this thing would come into the room and press against them, and that it would move around the room as they lay there. When the kids told Mrs. Dodd, she was very skeptical. She assumed that these kids were playing some sort of silly, coordinated prank on her, and she was annoyed by this. She told them to stop being silly. Just slow down for a moment consider that. Kids do play tricks on their parents sometimes, so it's really quite reasonable that Mrs. Dodd did not believe their claim of some kind of presence in their room touching them. But imagine you're a kid who keeps feeling something in your bedroom, touching your leg, jabbing your arm, squeezing your hand as you sleep. It'd be so frightening, but even more so when your parent refuses to believe you. Well, one night, one of the kids was feeling unwell, and he asked his mum if she would come and keep him company in the bed. She agreed, and she lay with him. But then, during the night, Brian whispered to her in fear. He said, it's happening again. Something was touching him in the darkness right now, pressing against him through the bedclothes. Mrs. Dodd was sick of this, and so she decided enough was enough. It was the middle of the night. She had no time for jokes at this hour. And so she started to prop herself up in the bed to tell Brian that his dumb prank had gone too far. But then, well, here's what happened next in her own words that she said to that Tyneside newspaper. Listen to this. I had gone into the children's bedroom to sleep with one of them who was unwell. And my 10-year-old son, Brian, kept telling me that he felt something touching him. I told him not to be so silly. And then I saw this shape. It came towards me. And I definitely felt it touch me on the legs. And then, on all fours, it moved out of the room. I was terrified and screamed for my husband. At first, Mrs. Dodd thought it looked like some kind of, well, some kind of werewolf. Though later, when the shock had worn off, she said it could have been, quote, like a half-human, half-sheep-like creature. Whatever the case, this was absolutely horrifying and was so fundamentally wrong that it was naturally difficult to categorize in the moment. And yet she saw this thing padding downstairs. She screamed so loudly that the Robson family heard the commotion next door. 
Jenny Robson later told reporters for the BBC Nationwide programme that they heard a crash and screams coming from Mrs. Dodd through their wall next door. And in a pretty creepy detail, they went to investigate this thing that night and found Mrs. Dodd's front door was open, almost as if the entity had rushed out of the Dodd's house and hurried outside to go where? I don't know. Maybe to return to the stones next door. Mrs. Dodd was so petrified by this incident and so worried about her children and their complaints of being touched in the night that she spoke to the local council who owned the house. Her distress clearly came across as authentic because Hexham Town Council agreed to rehouse the family on account of the horrifying experiences she told them about. The Robsons, however, did not seek rehousing. Perhaps that's because they never saw any wolf-like entities, yet... Strange paranormal activity did persist at number three, while the stone heads were in the home. For example, on one night, members of the family witnessed a weird glowing light hovering in the garden, and this mysterious glow was right above where the boys had dug up those heads. Paul Screeton was a journalist in the region at the time, and he had a particular interest in the paranormal, and he has written a book on this topic, which I'll put a link to in the show notes. He first examined the case in 1977 when he went to visit the house one day and there was no answer. And so Screeton said he, quote, sneaked into the back garden and he was confronted by the Robson brothers, Colin and Leslie. And he was able to ask them some questions and the boys told them about this strange flower which had bloomed on a plant that was at the spot of the head's discovery. They even said that this plant seemed to glow they also said they saw a glowing light hovering over the area where they had buried Sparky, the pet budgerigar, which had died following the poltergeist activity. This was all while the heads were in the house. Well, the events were just too weird to cope with, and so it was decided that the Robson family would pass these objects on to Newcastle Museum. They were packaged up, taken away. And this appeared to bring the paranormal reports to an end on Reed Avenue. Though a later tenant was scared of the possibility of residual haunting, and so they arranged for a priest to carry out an exorcism of the house. Yet just because the heads had now left the Robson home didn't mean the story was over. Far from it. Because a professor seeking to understand the origin of the heads would soon see some horrendous activity in her own home, and it was shockingly similar to what Mrs. Dodd had seen crawling through her son's bedroom. The specialists at Newcastle Museum began to examine the heads in detail, yet they struggled to find a precise origin to the stones. They realized they would have to bring in a more qualified specialist, and so they contacted Dr. Anne Ross at Southampton University. She was a well-regarded archaeologist with a specialism in Celtic history. The Celts, by the way, were a collection of tribes with their origins in Central Europe, but they spread throughout Western Europe, including Britain, in around 1000 BC. Well, it was November of 1971 when Dr. Anne Ross was able to start examining the Hexham heads. She felt that they were most likely from the 2nd century AD and that there were examples of Celtic head worship. This is based on a theory of some scholars, including Ross, that the Celts had a particular veneration for the human head, that they saw this as the seat of the human soul, and so heads were greatly valued. Indeed, they would even go so far as chopping off the heads of enemies because it was seen as a great honor to collect the heads. Well, Dr. Anne Ross was a believer in the cult of the human head idea, and she made the link to Hexham, particularly because the area was known to have such Celts in pre-Roman times. Indeed, other stone heads had been discovered across the northeast of England. So were the Hexham heads examples of this veneration of heads, or were they carved stone effigies to ward off evil spirits or to encourage fertility? Well, who knows? But if Dr. Ross assumed that these were just another example of Celtic head worship, she would quickly discover that these particular specimens were very different because the frightening paranormal activity that had started 300 miles to the north on Reed Avenue seemed to travel with these little stone curios. You see, due to her lecturing commitments at the university, Dr. Ross decided to take the heads home with her where she could study them in her spare time. She didn't realize that bringing these items home would unleash a terrifying supernatural onslaught that would threaten to bring, and I quote, the breakdown of her family. 
1973, the Reader's Digest published a book called Folklore, Myths and Legends. This was only a couple of years after the events of the Hexham Heads. One of the major contributors to the book was Dr. Anne Ross. And in the introduction, she is very open about the strange events that happened in her home. The weirdness started with how these heads made her feel. Despite examining many similar stone heads during her archaeological career, she wrote this of the heads of Hexham. She said, Though there was nothing unpleasant about the appearance of the heads, I took an immediate instinctive dislike to them. I left them in the box they had been sent in and put it in my study. I planned to have them geologically analyzed and then to return them as soon as possible to the north. Well, a night or two after the Stoneheads arrived, something horrendous happened in her bedroom. At the time, she didn't connect this incident with the heads, but she certainly would later. She said, she was asleep in bed when she suddenly woke at 2 a.m. Remember, that weird activity that happened in the Robson household would happen around 2.30 a.m. And she writes this. I woke up suddenly at about 2 a.m., deeply frightened and very cold. I looked towards the door and by the corridor light glimpsed a tall figure slipping out of the room. That detail gave me the chills. The idea that something had perturbed Dr. Ross enough in her sleep to make her open her eyes, but then that this figure seemed to respond to her waking by leaving the room. This implies that her waking had prompted its exit, which by extension means that it must have been waiting and watching her while she slept. She'd later talk to the author Peter Underwood in 1978 and share that this figure was about six feet tall and was slightly stooping. She said the lower parts of the creature had the legs of a human being, but there was something weirdly wolf-like about the upper part of the body. The room was dark, but she told Underwood that there was a moment when this thing passed out in front of the door so that it contrasted with the white paint of the wood. And she saw more detail and got the impression that this had distinct fur. Now you might be thinking what I thought. Mrs. Dodd had claimed to see a loping wolf-like creature in her home up in Hexham, so surely Dr. Ross was being influenced by the story, and it was making her imagine things. People have written about that and saying that's what must have happened. The only problem with that theory is when you read Dr. Ross's own account, she says that she hadn't heard that story, that she would only discover it later. Right now, on this night, she was completely unaware of it. And so she was seeing something fresh, and it was shockingly similar to what happened in Hexham. She carries on in the Reader's Digest book, saying this. My impression was that the figure was dark like a shadow, and that it was part animal and part man. I felt compelled to follow it, as if by some irresistible force. I heard it whatever it was, going downstairs. So Dr. Ross obeyed that strange compulsion to follow the beast, which meant she was about to see it very clearly. You see, their young son was five years old at the time, and they would keep the landing light on always to make him feel safe. This meant that when she left her room, she clearly saw this creature, this apparition, whatever it was, and she said it was now moving down the staircase. And she said that the light from the bulb made it absolutely and clearly visible. So this was not her misinterpreting a shadow in a dark bedroom. This was right in front of her. And what happened next was startling. The thing reached halfway down the staircase when it suddenly leapt over the banister and landed on the floor. She said she heard it making contact with the hallway floor and said it sounded heavy. It then turned and scampered away to the rear part of the house. Still, she felt this weird, inexplicable compulsion to follow it, a courage to follow it, a kind of absence of fear, but just curiosity. And so she walked down the staircase after it. But this is interesting. Something changed when she reached the bottom of the stairs. Stepping onto the hallway from the bottom step was almost like the flick of a switch in her mind because that weird compulsion, the boldness to follow the thing, suddenly vanished. And in that moment, she became desperately afraid. She wrote, And then I saw it again, moving along the corridor that leads to the kitchen. But now I was too 
terrified to go on. I went back upstairs to the bedroom and woke Dick, my husband. He searched the house, but found nothing. No sign at all of any disturbance. We thought that I must have had a nightmare, though I could hardly believe that a nightmare could seem surreal and decided to say nothing about it. Now, if that was all that had happened, then yeah, perhaps Dr. Ross and her husband, a commercial artist, could have put this down to an overactive imagination or the most vivid dream of her life. She might not have even linked it to the heads, but then, four days later, another experience came that would change her mind for good. Anne and her husband had spent the day in London, which is about two and a half hours' drive from Southampton. They arrived back home in the evening at about six o'clock. Now, remember their son was only five years old, but they had a daughter called Berenice. She was 15. They were happy to leave her to look after her younger brother while they were in London. But they were cautious about strangers, so the family had a pre-arranged special signal, a series of knocks, I assume, on the door, so that the daughter would know it was safe to open it when someone came. Well, they got back from London and did this special code knocking. And Berenice came to the door and the parents immediately knew something was desperately wrong. They hurried inside and they asked Berenice, what on earth's wrong? What she told them would chill them to the bone. Berenice had been at school that day, but she'd returned home at 4 p.m., about two hours earlier. And she said that she came back from school, unlocked the door and walked into the house. And this is how Dr. Ross described it. She said, When she had come in from school, the first thing she had seen was something huge, dark and inhuman on the stairs. It had rushed down towards her, vaulted over the banisters and landed in the corridor with a soft thud that made her think its feet were padded like those of an animal. It had run toward her room, and though terrified, she had felt that she had to follow it. At the door, it had vanished, leaving her in the state in which we found her. This is fascinating and terrifying. Remember that Dr. Ross did not know about the wolf sighting in Hexham, and Berenice had no idea of what had happened to her mother a few nights before because her and her husband decided to keep it quiet. But now she had just described having a pretty much identical experience, including that weird, horrible sense of the entity luring her or having a strange, fearless compulsion to follow it, just like Dr. Ross had said. Before the fear had suddenly kicked in, Dr. Ross elaborated in her 1978 interview with Peter Underwood, saying that Berenice had described it as, quote, as near a werewolf as anything. Since this had happened, poor Berenice had just sat in the house, terrified and desperate for her parents to get back from London, and she waited that two hours in total terror. Once again, they searched the house and found nothing out of the ordinary. In time, all members of the Ross family would claim to witness that frightening wolf-like apparition, if that's what it was, roaming the house. They heard banging and crashing without any obvious cause. Dr. Ross said she would often feel a very cold presence in the house. Quote, More than once we have heard the same soft thud of an animal's pads near the staircase. Several times my study door has burst open and there's been no one there and no wind to account for it. And on one other occasion, when Berenice and I were coming downstairs together, we both thought we saw a dark figure ahead of us and heard it land in the corridor after vaulting over the banisters. Now, Dr. Ross was a respected author, scholar, archaeologist. I am sure she recognized the genuinely wild nature of her claims, and yet she was very open about it, both to the Reader's Digest in 73, but then also in February of 1976, when she was interviewed on national TV about the incident for the BBC news program Nationwide. When she first saw that nightmarish creature in her bedroom, she hadn't made any connection with the heads that were sitting in their box in her study in the house. But she did now. Because listen, she wrote this in the Reader's Digest. The reason why I associate the heads with this haunting, if that's what it is, is this. 
Later, I learned that on the night when the heads had first been discovered, the North Country woman who lived next door to the garden where they had been unearthed was putting her child to bed. When a horrifying creature, she described it as half man and half animal, came into the room. Well, Dr. Ross kept the heads for several months, but she eventually sent the heads back up north. I found a quote from the time by a man called Paul Devereaux, who said that Anne Ross, quote, had the heads removed because she quite frankly feared the physical breakdown of her family. And so she sent them back. Well, the origin of the stones was brought into question in 1972 when a 53-year-old lorry driver claimed that he had made the heads as a toy for his daughter. Desmond Craigie from Northumberland had indeed lived in Number 3 Reed Avenue for many years before the Robsons had moved in, and he said his daughter had seen the heads on Tyne T's news and had come running to tell him that the heads he had made were now famous. In 1972, Craigie was quoted as saying, I have been laughing my head off about these heads, and I cannot understand why all the attention is being paid to them. Now, Anne Ross, who had previously said the stones were ancient, she was open to the idea that the stones may have been modern. Yet what she was convinced at was that they had been purposefully fashioned in the style of genuine Celtic stone heads, which she was an expert in. She said it was extremely unlikely for Craigie to have just made them that way by accident. This opened a new possibility that some considered, including Anne Ross. What if these objects were indeed modern, but were deliberately made by some obscure pagan cult? Does that mean this modern-day cult had Mr. Craigie as a member? Dr. Ross offered considerable evidence that some ancient pagan Celtic practices were indeed still being carried out in the remote High Peak district of Derbyshire, and that carved stone heads, just like the Hexham heads, were still being made in modern times as part of this ancient pagan practice. Well, Craigie became deeply upset when some members of the public said he must be some sort of pagan or even a devil worshipper for making these objects. While the claims of Craigie may well have challenged the theory that the heads were ancient, but the paranormal strangeness connected to them would continue. After Dr. Ross had finally rid herself of the heads, they ended up in the possession of a man called Don Robbins. He was an inorganic chemist with the Institute of Archaeology, and he had a theory about the relationship between natural objects, especially stone, and the human nervous system. He claimed that this relationship might explain some paranormal events. He wrote a book exploring this in 1988, and he called it The Secret Language of Stone, which explores this theory, including the infamous stone tape theory. If you're not sure what this is, it's a paranormal hypothesis that energy from certain events can become imprinted or absorbed into the physical environment, and even replayed under certain conditions, you know, like a tape recorder. This idea was popularized in a 1970s TV drama written by Nigel Neal. So this theory was, could it be that these stone heads, perhaps the quartz within them, had somehow captured a moment in time and was replaying it? That might explain the repetitive nature of the encounters, particularly involving Mrs. Ross and her daughter, which certainly seems to be a repeat of the same sequence, the going down the stairs, the vaulting over the top. It's an intriguing thought, and yet the idea of stone tape theory really is just a theory. There's a lack of empirical evidence to back it up. And besides, there are times in this case where the frightening apparition does seem to respond to the witness, like slipping out of the room when Dr. Ross wakes up or running out of the room when Mrs. Dodd screamed. Why would a recording respond to a person? Recordings just play, don't they? They don't change or adapt depending on the viewer. Well... After discussion with Dr. Anne Ross and one of her colleagues, Don Robbins, was offered a chance to take the heads home with him, so he could examine them more closely. This took him aback, because he had hoped to view them, perhaps, and maybe even take a photograph. He hadn't banked on taking them home, but he felt he couldn't refuse. Though, when he put the heads into his briefcase and left the building that day, he admitted in his book that he felt a genuine sense of nervousness. As if to confirm this worry about the heads, he got into his car and turned the ignition, and the car was dead. 
the electrical system had failed, even though there had been no problems before this. He managed to sort the fuse box out and then was able to drive home to London, though he said it was a, quote, apprehensive drive. Back at his house, he was feeling so unsettled in the presence of these heads that he decided he did not want them in the house. So with the heads inside a box, he wrapped the box in a plastic bag and placed it under a tree at the edge of the garden, the far edge. Once done, he went back into the house feeling uneasy. That night, he said that he struggled to sleep, and now and then he would get up out of bed, pull the curtain back and look out of his window into the darkness of the night and the garden. He did this several times, but he didn't see anything, nothing unusual. When he went to check on them the next morning, they were just as they had been before. So for two months, he kept the heads in his house, usually in his garden shed, and he had no encounter with any black figures or wolf-like phantoms. However, there are some odd moments that he discovered. He noticed a peculiar detail that he said was very disturbing. No matter how he placed the stone heads on a table, he said he was always noticing that at least one eye of the female head could see him wherever he was in the room, no matter where he went. He said that there was a sensation of that thing watching him, perhaps even turning to follow him. He said it was, quote, distinctly unsettling and chilling. Then he had a number of colleagues come to the house to photograph the heads using all sorts of professional techniques and equipment. They had excellent conditions for the display of these objects, for the lighting of them. And so they were all surprised when the pictures were developed. And all of the shots showed vague and overexposed shots of the heads. This inability to photograph the heads, despite having excellent equipment, professionally trained camera operators, and perfect conditions, made Robbins wonder if this was why there hadn't been that many photographs of the heads. Did they emit some sort of power that caused cameras to struggle to capture them on film? It reminded him, it reminds me, of other paranormal cases where cameras struggle to pick up phenomena. How many times have you heard someone say that they see some sort of ghost or whatever in front of their naked eyes, they take a picture, and when you look at the picture, you think, really? And that can make you dismiss it. But what happened in this case could suggest maybe the presence of these things actually affects the camera. Indeed, that team checked and rechecked the cameras exhaustively, and yet the session was classed, and I quote, as a total failure. Robin started to experiment with the heads. He placed them near his staircase in the house to see if it might prompt the dark wolf-like figure to appear for him. He didn't really want it to appear, he was pretty scared, but he didn't want to waste his opportunity for experimentation, so he did. He said he did sense a very strange tingling in the area where the heads were near the stairs, but other than that, and a growing feeling of dread around these heads, he didn't see a figure. I've read some theories that suggest that perhaps the paranormal activity in his home was not as great because he didn't have children. And indeed, in the three houses where the activity was at its most dramatic, they all had children. Did the lack of children in his home for those months mean that the stone stayed, like, locked in somehow? Who knows? Well, Don Robbins was then contacted by various people who wanted to see the heads, including a dowser called Frank Hyde. Dowsing is a practice that uses a kind of tool, like a rod, pendulum, or a forked stick to locate hidden substances or objects. I had my first experience of dowsing in an old Saxon pub in Transylvania when someone handed me one and said, find the water. I walked around having no idea where the water was, and I knew nothing about dowsing, and they, it went down. And sure enough, they said, you found the right place. But anyway, Don drove the heads to Frank in Kilburn, West London, in February 1978. Hyde started to carry out, divining on the stones using a pendulum with metal rods. They seemed to show activity when placed near the female head. Robson was impressed with Hyde's divining skills and agreed to let him keep the heads for a short time. Then the plan was for Hyde to return them so Robbins could pass them on to others he knew who were interested in them. Hyde said he'd let Robbins know how the experiments on the stones went, and Robbins said as he drove away he felt, quote, a great feeling of relief that the wall-eyed hag was somewhere else. Robbins waited to hear back from Hyde about his progress, but heard nothing, and was only later 
that Robbins ran into the person who had first introduced him to Hyde. And so Robbins asked him, how was Hyde doing? And he was shocked by the answer. Apparently Frank Hyde had been injured in a serious car crash and not long after he had took possession of the heads too. In fact, Robbins said he never heard from Frank Hyde again after that. Paul Screeton, who I mentioned earlier, who wrote a book on the Hexham Heads, claims that Frank's daughter said there was no car crash. And yet, whatever the case, Frank Hyde did seem to just vanish from this story, and the stones have vanished along with him. Did Hyde give them away, or were they lost in a crash? We just don't know. We just know that the location of the Heads today remains a mystery. Well, how might we explain the bizarre events that surround the Hexham Heads? Well, there seems to be two elements to this case. One concerns the heads themselves. Were they really ancient, like the archaeology professor Dr. Ross claimed? Or were they made by Des Craigie, the lorry driver from Northumberland? Without being able to examine them, we might never know. And yet, even if they did turn out to have been made by Des Craigie, does that change the wild events that happened to the Robson family and then the Dodds family next door? And then to every member of the Ross family down in Southampton. This appeared like a classic poltergeist case seen by multiple witnesses in three different locations. What was that horrifying apparition seen by Mrs. Dodd and the entire Ross family? Was it some sort of guardian of the Hexham heads? Or were the heads there to keep it at bay until they were removed and all hell broke loose? Might it even have been related to a chilling story from 70 years before. Yes, in December of 1904, the village of Allendale, a mere 10 miles from Hexham, was filled with reports of a large, dark wolf that had been slaughtering the animals on farms. Sheep carcasses were found, partly devoured and mutilated, while other sheep had been bitten on the legs. At the time, the Hexham Courant reported that a hunting party of over 100 people tried to track down the wolf. Could the sighting of this beast be related to that? Or could this be simply a very strange, contagious haunting that featured animalistic style entities? Were they ghosts, stone tape recordings, demons? Share your theories below and dig into the detail from either Paul Screeton's book or an excellent blog called Hexham Heads, which I'll link in the show notes, which offers a great deal of information on the case. That blog actually provided a Street View link to the house on Reed Avenue. I looked at it and checked it out and examined the house. But then I decided to check out what the house looks like today because the link on that site was different to the one I found, the current link. When I looked at the current Google Maps link, I was examining the house when something caught my eye. There was a message scrawled between the two doors of the house. And this message at first I thought said, we called have Nana and Rachel. And I thought, oh my goodness, what is that? Sounds like a kidnap threat or something. But from another angle I looked, and I think it's more likely to say, we called love Nana and Rachel. Well, this case cannot help but make us ask, who or what else called on number one and number three, Reed Avenue? Well, as we close this chapter on the Hexham Heads, let's not forget that the most terrifying things are often those we think we understand until they show us otherwise. It's easy to dismiss the tales of stone heads and shadowy figures as mere stories. But what if they aren't just tales? What if the true horror lies not in ancient rituals or forgotten folklore, but in the objects that seem ordinary yet hold the power to disrupt our reality? Perhaps tonight... As you lie in your bed, you will glance at that trinket on your shelf, that old heirloom you've never given much thought to. And maybe, just maybe, you'll wonder, what secrets does it hold? And what might it awaken in the dark of your room? Indeed, the frightening wolf-like creature watched Dr. Ross as she slept until she happened to wake to see it. Who's to say? Something isn't watching you as you sleep. You've just been lucky enough not to wake up to it.
yet. I'm Peter Laws, and you've been listening to the horror of the Hexam Heads. Good night. If you're enjoying these videos, would you please consider liking or subscribing? It really makes a difference. Thank you.